Greg Williams, it's long overdue, brother. When I first messaged back and forth with, with your colleague, Brian, um, I knew I wanted both of you on the podcast because, uh, you know, I was familiar with the Marine Corps Hunter program back when I saw some hip pocket classes when I was in Romania and mm-hmm. what those sergeants were teaching, the fundamentals they were teaching was were pretty incredible. Um, and again, I just saw some basic hip, hip pocket classes. Um, so when your cohort, when your, when your colleague Brian said that you had a hand in help writing the whole program, I knew I had to get you on the podcast. We just had to meet. Well, thank you. I, I, honored to be here. Uh, longtime listener, huge fan. Uh, shout out to episode 252 with uh, John Legato. That was a great one. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> Way city to, to nine years undercover with the mob. Um, yeah, it's pretty incredible. Um, well, before we get too deep into Combat Hunter, um, just like every interview on Born the Battle, we start with that initial question. Uh, where and when did you know that military service was going to be the next step in your life? And of course, we asked that question in that way because some guys get drafted. They don't volunteer. Um, but I don't think you're that old. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's that far back for you. Um, when did you know that military service was going to be the next step in your life? Yeah, my uh, my, my family, uh, uh, all of the male members of my family, except for one brother uh, uh, and my father's, my uncle's going way back on both sides. Uh, all served in the military. Uh, wasn't my career track uh, at the beginning. Uh, I, I grew up in uh, in Detroit and the surrounding suburbs. Uh, I had a different uh, uh, tack in mind for my life, but uh, when it when it came to uh, a situation, uh, I was thinking, hey, listen, uh, don't have a job. I'm getting in a lot of trouble. I I don't think I'll survive in the streets if I continue on the tack that I'm going. Uh, so I, mm. I drove my motorcycle uh, all the way through uh, uh, Michigan, sort of as a goodbye to uh, to my my home in Michigan. Drove to uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. There was a, uh, a bank of enlistment options there: uh, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the the, the Army, the Air Force, of course. Uh, back then, I walked into the Marine recruiter because my dad was a, a, a storied Marine vet, and uh, asked them for an enlistment bonus. They laughed and threw mm. me out, pushed me down. Uh, went to the army. The army said, come on in, come on in. It was a party <laughs> atmosphere. They had a charcuterie uh, table set up and uh, some champagne. And uh, I signed up and I was in the army the next day. I never regretted the uh, the move one time. I, I craved the structure that the army offered. Gotcha. Yeah. You, uh, you know, in a previous conversation, you said the army saved your life. Uh, in, in what way did the army save your life? There were... Uh, darn few options for uh, consistent work in Detroit at the time, unless you were a hood. And it was very easy mm. being a hood. And I was quite good at it. Uh, I was I was a big kid. Uh, I started carrying a gun at 13. Uh, intimidation, uh, those type of uh, uh, opportunities were rampant. Um, I, I didn't want to follow rules. I wasn't very good at school. Uh, 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 I, I just, I didn't have a center. And so uh, martial arts uh, started forming that center. But the problem was early on, I, I missed uh, uh, what martial arts was all about. And I was using it for the dark side. So I thought to myself, you know, if I stay out here and I continue doing bad stuff and running from the cops and living on the edge, sooner or later, I'm going to wind up dead or in jail. Uh, uh, so that was a huge catalyst in my life. I, I was married at 17 years old. I was uh, 17 and had a baby on the way in basic training. I was one of those guys that had to send a card to the parents. Uh, saying, "Hey, look, I'm still alive. I'm just in basic training." Uh, but yeah, if I if I would have stuck around back then, I was wow. making poor choices, and I think I would have continued to make uh, worse choices. Very good, very good. Um, Greg, what years did you serve? When what, what, what was your gig? 1980 to 1986, U.S. Army Infantry, 11 Bravo. Uh, it was the level that offered me uh, the most lateral uh, and upward mobility at the time. I was lucky enough to make. Uh, Sergeant E5 in two years and two days after my enlistment, which also uh, allowed me some opportunities. And I, I got to take the skills that I had learned on the street, the martial arts skills, hone them, learn these new uh, 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 battle ready skills from the army. Uh, and they put it all in structure, uh, allowed me discipline uh, and, and really allowed me to grow into uh, uh, the person you see today. Gotcha. Very good. Um, you know, you and, I, you and I talked a little bit about how, you know, the military was a little different back in the eighties, a little bit different back before, oh, yeah. you know, in the nineties, you know, before what it is today. Um, while you were in, 
uh, give me that story about your greatest, greatest, or your greatest mentor or your best friend. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. So uh, uh, my family was knocked down, drag out. I had a I had a mom that was first generation German uh, that taught with her fist. Uh, I had a dad uh, uh, that that was a Marine uh, that taught lessons with his boots and his fist. And so I was no stranger to adversity. Uh, uh, you know, and and fighting was a way of communicating. Uh, uh, violence was was a language uh, uh, where I grew up. Uh, so I'm in the military and I'm thinking, okay, I got this. You know, I'm the I'm the barracks lawyer. Uh, uh, nobody can do this. They can't touch it. They can't yell at you. Um, I'm a big kid, so I'm not afraid of mixing it up, you know? And uh, I had a Sergeant First Class Juan Saucedo uh, and uh, uh, Staff Sergeant uh, uh, Kevin Lay. And Saucedo took me off to the side right away and said, hey, kid, you got something, but you're letting your fist and your feet get in the way of all of this, you know, your bravado. And I was like, yeah, yeah, pal, I, I've seen it all done. All, you know, you are when you were a kid. And again, I was, you know, 17, not even 18 yet. So they had this uh, six oh, yeah. man squad. You bay. Know everything. Yeah, you do. And, and, and so the six man squad bait uh, was left vacant uh, for just such an occasion. And he said, Hey, come on, we're, we're going to have a heart to heart, but we didn't have a heart to heart. He mopped the floor with me. I mean, we were brawling and uh, he was taking some hits, but he was given a lot more than he was taking. And at the end of it, he said, we can keep this up forever. Or you can, put down the gloves and you can start thinking, you know, the most important six inches on the battle space is between your ears. And uh, it took to me, it was like, you know, why do I have to, uh, uh, you know, leave a legacy of, of hate, death and fear and violence when, when this guy is saying, Hey, listen, I grew up same place. You grew up just in a different, you know, geographic location with the same challenges and look what I've become. And I looked at him and I mean, he was always together. He always mm. had the right answers. Uh, he was physically fit. He was always leading out the run and calling cadence. And when you're young, boy, that does something to you. And it, uh, uh, it gave me, uh, uh, the path and showed me the structure that I wanted to pursue for the rest of my life. Uh, at least he, um, you, at least you guys put gloves on. Uh, no, uh, uh, that's a metaphor. <laughs> so, and you know, uh, you know that when the gloves come off, those type Very of good. things, you know, good, oh, yeah. no, no. Back, back, back then it was bare knuckle all the way. And I'll tell you what, uh, uh, the army hasn't changed much and the Marine Corps hasn't changed much in the fact that, uh, you have people that are in key positions that are very passionate about the ethos and, and, uh, they want to keep, uh, it alive. And I'm not talking that, that you yes. have to punch somebody to get your message across. I'm talking about that they're willing uh, to make you the very best that you can be if you're interested uh, in, in, in meeting them uh, halfway. I know, 100%. Um, Greg, why did you why did you decide to leave active duty? When, and yeah. when did you do it? So, so uh, uh, the active duty, there was, a, there was a time in my life where I was given choices that were 01 and 03 NOR uh, uh, opportunities, but they were all unaccompanied. So to go Ocona unaccompanied uh, was a non-starter with a young family at that time. And so uh, had I known what I know yeah. now, I, I would have fully embraced those. Uh, but, you know, uh, my, my wife at the time, I was married for, for uh, 10 years, my, my first marriage, uh, 10 and out, we called it. Uh, and, and the idea was that, hey, listen, you know, you're, you're globe hopping. Uh, has to stop. You're a father uh, of two now. You know what I'm saying? I don't even know you. The kids have never seen you. And it was all me. Uh, trust me, it wasn't the military that did that. It was me chasing this dream that the military kept doing the carrot and the stick. Uh, uh, and and I was treating my family to all stick. I, I didn't give them the opportunity of, of uh, you know, doing the globetrotting fun stuff that I was doing. Uh, and so I, uh, again, uh, I was young. And, and so I made a choice then to get out. Uh, the only thing I knew was Detroit, uh, go back to Detroit and get a job. Lucky enough, uh, my, my career path and my skills uh, got me into police work. And again, uh, police work welcomed me. Uh, it was a skill set that I had a lot of uh, uh, experience in. Uh, so, I, I mean, you know, running from the law and being in the back of a scout car, not unlike driving a police car and going on patrol uh, looking for bad guys. So the same skills, basically. Man, you're talking about Detroit in 1986. You're talking about the martial arts genre of the late 70s, the 80s. I got this idea in my head. It's like RoboCop. It's like Karate Kid. Like it's almost like that was your oh, life. If, if, yeah, if you were to put it I, in I was, perspective, <laughs> I, I love that. I love that, Tanner. But I'm nobody. I'm nothing. I've never been anywhere. My, my thing was that that uh, growing up in an environment where violence is a language, 
you you become fluent or you become a victim. And I certainly wasn't going to be victimized. And and so my idea was uh, the military is just an extension of the martial arts. Police work is just an extension of the military. So I found a groove in the record where I could operate just like I do now. I, I mean, my entire life is in shambles. But when it comes to human behavior, pattern recognition analysis or teaching people how to predict danger, I'm the Mac Daddy. I mean, I got that down pat. So, so as long as I can stay in that lane, I'm pretty good in that lane. Uh, when I get outside of that, I'm not much of a virtuoso. I don't sing or dance very well. Uh, you know, I, I've uh, got a kid uh, uh, that's a doctor. I've I've got another kid that's that's got nine jobs. He's good at every one of them, and his wife's a doctor. So I, I can't complain about that. None of those opportunities uh, uh, would have availed themselves had I not. Uh, had this bolt out of the blue and, and joined the army and become a veteran. Uh, the, the status of being a veteran opened many doors that would not have been open to me. Um, a very humbling statement you just said. You said, I'm very good at this, even though my life is, my, my life, and, and you had a very piece of humility where you're like, everything outside of that may be a, a, a record or, or yeah. not perfect, but I'm very good at this. Why? What made you say something like that? I, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I believe and to be humility. self-aware about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I really appreciate that because, look, a lot of people uh, now use humility as like, I'm humble, but then they go into really douchebaggery uh, uh, related uh, things. My, my thing is this. Uh, clearly, I was put on this planet to transmit uh, the signal, uh, uh, laser focus signal about how to predict uh, human behavior to avoid uh, danger or threats or uh, uh, to avail yourself of an opportunity that other people aren't seeing. So in that bandwidth, in that frequency, I'm the king, okay? Now, if I start f- going outside of that, it's, it's what society does wrong sometimes with politics. I saw you in a movie, and you were one hell of an actor, so I'm going to ask you what car to buy. <laughs> I'm I'm uh, amazed at your ability on the pulpit <laughs> when you're you're talking about you know this political thing. So uh, I'm going to uh, uh, ask you about my health care. We're we're uh, not the brightest uh, on the planet when it comes to aligning ourselves with with our skill set, and and so I I stick with my skill set. Uh, I stay in that skill set, and I constantly. Uh, study to get better at it. And, and, uh, you know, uh, Brian Marin and I, I mean, we go all over the globe and, and if somebody can afford a lot of money, we charge them a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, if, if the folks can't, we do it for free. And, 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 and so I won't stop teaching because that's my way of giving back and opening somebody else's eyes to all these opportunities that I got when I was younger. Human pattern behavior recognition. Uh, like you said, you, you you're highly recognized for it. You're highly mm-hmm. sought after for it. Every every agency with three letters has you, you've trained uh, tier one units um, yep. to be that good at something. What does it take for someone to reach that level of expertise, or to that, be known to be the guy or girl? Another reason I I, I love Born the Battle and and love your style, Tanner, uh, because that's exactly the right question at the right time. So here's the thing: you have to give up a lot. I gave up absolutely everything uh, uh, to be this person. People come to me and they go, hey, I want to be you. I, you know, I'm not going to bullshit you. I want to be you. And there's a lot of people that do what I do that have doctorates and have uh, 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 novels on a shelf and have never been outside the wire. Uh, uh, the key is that you got to figure out what it is. What, what's that, what's that uh, uh, orbit within which you want to operate? And so early on, uh, when I was trying to find myself, I knew that it was going to be predictive analysis because things happen for a reason. And I get tired of people saying, well, it came out of nowhere. Nothing comes out of nowhere. Everything is part of predictive analysis. There's cues. There's cues form clusters. Look, if, if you've got a crappy life, your crappy life didn't just occur. It was a function of a bunch of choices that you made. Now, one day, and I would tell this to every deploying Marine, uh, one day you're going to step outside of that uh, uh, collat and you're going to take a left instead of a right. And, you know, with all the training that you had, you're going to miss that ID or you're going to miss that bullet or you're going to miss that comet that splintered off uh, and, and it's going to come down and it's going to change your world forever. 
But that doesn't happen all the time. And it's so rare they make movies out of that kind of stuff. They write novels about it. So don't make your life this victimology where you're constantly saying, oh, I got a hard hand and I got this. I had all of that. I, you know, uh, uh, if you want to talk about uh, substance abuse or sexual abuse or, or, or you know, again, violence was how we communicated in the family. Yeah, I've been through all of that. But, but I'm not going to rest on that. That's not going to be my cane. That was my starting point for opportunity. If I see you, uh, uh, you know, hunching your shoulders and puffing out your chest and your histamine count goes up and your, your fists start to ball, well, those are pre-event indicators that you're angry. Now, people can go all day long and be angry and still function in a normal society. But that one step past that is rage. And rage is a nonsensical emotion. It doesn't uh, do anything for you. Uh, nobody wrote uh, fight, flight, freeze, or rage, right? So, so the idea is I was able to see those things early and pattern them in my own life. Because I was running with gangs, uh, the gangs exhibited a lot of that human behavior. Uh, 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 because my family was uh, dysfunctional, uh, my family exhibited that. Because I was running from the cops, I had a pattern recognize the cops. But that's only half of the coin. So the analysis is the other part. Every one of your listeners has done it before. You knew when you walked into a bar uh, uh, when the fight was about to start. The atmospherics changed, the biometrics changed, those things. But what it was is nobody ever asked you, okay, now sit down for a minute and yellow pad that for me and show me what those pieces were. So I devoted my entire life to doing that, to recording everybody and their human behavior patterns in a certain uh, uh, environment, and then how to analyze those to determine what's likely going to go on. And most of it is chicanery and sh in, in, in uh, uh, parlor tricks, meaning that, that there's people that just work in body language. Look, body language doesn't mean anything. It's so context uh, uh, specific yeah. that, that if you're not, if you don't know the person and you don't know the external schema and you're not sure what their psychological stance is, you're just guessing. You know, you're back to swinging those 16 ounce gloves in a big uh, 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 dark room. Uh, but uh, what we do and what, what I invented is the idea that uh, heuristics, those things in your environment that speak to you and the geographics, things like environmental uh, 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 causation and atmospheric shifts uh, uh, coupled with biometrics and, you know, all of these things come together. And then, you know, like proxemics is a whole uh, uh, yeah. art on its own. Uh, 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 but people write all the time about six inches to 10 inches means this and that. It's all, part of my language. It's all horse crap. Because when, when I'm in Iraq or I'm in Afghanistan or I'm in Yemen, uh, culture becomes context for what I'm seeing, smelling, feeling, and tasting. So what we allowed with, with this sure. incredible training program is we allowed cops and first responders and soldier, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guard, uh, TSA, anybody else to look at a situation and use their critical thinking skills to go, this guy is likely more dangerous than this guy. This female is probably up to something. This vehicle, uh, suspicious parking job likely means something. And you know what? Likelihood is where it's at. Likelihood gives me the chance to uh, uh, hedge my bet and get out of a crappy situation if I see it coalescing, if I see it forming. I, I I love how we went from uh, what's it take to be great to a bar fight. I love that. Yeah, but I get what you're. Yeah, but, but all, you've basically what I'm. What I, what I, yeah, Tanner, those things, those things that you've experienced in your life define you, but you don't have to be defined by that. Hundred percent. So so the idea is if you create a series of of uh, uh, index cards of all of the experiences and all the stuff that you share with your friends and everything that you've seen, wh what you do is you create this Rolodex for uh, 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 a future encounter. And I can start saying that, well, when I see, uh, you know, there was that uncle that came into the room and it was a family reunion going on. And when that uncle came in the room, you saw all the little kids start spreading out and leaving. Well, there's a reason for that atmospheric shift. What's uncle up to? What's he doing with those kids? There was an aunt that came in and she used to squeeze your cheek and really hug you. Well, that's no different than the bar or at church or wherever else. The idea is combat is, is just uh, uh, all of those uh, uh, instances thrown into the most chaotic thing you've ever encountered in your entire life. And, and if you can make sense, if you can organize your thoughts around that, you can survive any situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I, I'm so f enamored with, with what you guys do. Um, but how did you get from police work and, and how long were you a police officer 
uh, to where you are now to get into the contracting game of human pattern, you know, human behavior pattern recognition. That's great. And, 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 and Tanner, two things we got that we're fighting right now. There's a delay because I'm in the middle of nowhere, Colorado, and thanks for being patient. Uh, and the second thing is you've graduated the basic course. If you can say human behavior pattern recognition analysis uh, three times without screwing <laughs> it up. It's a very big word. It's a very big word for uh, behavior, and, yes. you know, uh, predictive analysis. So the idea is that uh, uh, think about that timeline. So growing up as a hood rat, then uh, getting the structure of the army, then coming back and being able to utilize both of those skill sets as a copper and out thinking cunning enemies. Uh, uh, every terrorist is a criminal. Not every criminal uh, becomes a terrorist. So those skill sets all the way back in my history were very closely aligned. So I was a copper for 27 years and I was training everywhere. Uh, uh, I was training in less lethal force and de-escalation. I was training in all types of skills uh, uh, before pulling the trigger. So I was in high, I was in great demand for those things. Again, luck, it was all luck and I had the training and I was put in those situations. So uh, uh, my wife and I, another uh, human behavior profiler, excellent street copper, uh, just uh, uh, is so enamored with her. She's a CEO of our company. Uh, she and I said, hey, listen, uh, you know, we're not getting any younger. We want to see if there's more to life than just uh, uh, busting bad guys, which is fun, but you're not going to arrest yourself out of the situations our country finds itself mm. in. So uh, we both started looking for our dream jobs. And it was like, look, you know, we want to ride horses and we want to fly fish and, you know, we, we want to take Jeep tours and hike for antlers uh, and we want to hunt but we want to get paid to do it. And there's not very many jobs uh, uh, that fill that bill. So so my wife, Shelly, and I uh, uh, found a dude and guest ranch that was in need of some tender love and care uh, in the middle of nowhere, Colorado. Uh, moved there. Uh, in addition to the guest format, we had edge courses, which was our, our martial arts shooting, impact weapons, less than lethal force training uh, stuff. And uh, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to do the, enough research to get the uh, guiding and outfitting permits for the entire area, uh, including uh, primitive wilderness, which are, you know, you never get those. And uh, so I started uh, uh, offering what I called executive hunts. So you had to pay a lot of money to get just me to take you on a hunt. And the funny thing was, I, I, I had no idea of hunting. I had never hunted uh, before in my life, but I used the same principles of human behavior pattern recognition analysis on animals. And guess what? It worked fine. Animals are lazy. Animals do stupid things that they can't huh. take back. And so if you're going to ambush a human or you're going to ambush an animal, um, yeah, same skill. Uh, so uh, that led to the United States Marine Corps was in a bad way uh, uh, because uh, third Marine specifically uh, was getting a lot of casualties. Iraq was very kinetic. Things were very bad and they were looking for a way. And I'll, I'll hand it to uh, uh, General Jim Conway who was uh, the commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, he said, we got to do something. He started passing around uh, uh, bullet points to others. Uh, uh, Jim Mattis and Jim Amos and a couple of other uh, great generals said, hey, listen, why don't we start something where we get the skills of a hunter and the skills of a copper and the skills of a, a criminal and, and, and you know that kid that used to pheasant hunt on his way home from school. Why don't we get those together and maybe there's something there. If we push all those skill sets together, maybe they see something that other people don't. And uh, so one day at the ranch, they, they showed up and uh, for lack of a better term, abducted me to uh, Camp Pendleton uh, and then close to the flagpole back in Quantico. Uh, <laughs> it was sort of a test out. There was hundreds of, uh, of people that had a test out for the position and demonstrate what their skill sets were. I was uh, blessed and lucky enough that uh, I was down to the final three and we became the three pillars of combat hunter. It was myself that did all the human behavior uh, uh, profiling. Uh, it was David Scott Donaldson that did the uh, combat tracking. And then Ivan Carter uh, that was at the time uh, doing the third leg of the, the, the stool, which uh, ended up becoming uh, enhanced optics and observation. It, it underwent changes, transformative changes, because not everything survives combat. Is this when General Mattis gave you his endorsement of you and his concepts and called you a national treasure? Because that's yeah. back in the day. So, that's pretty. That's a pretty bold, bold statement. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. Okay, uh, General Jim Mattis is is a, a genius. He's a wonderful man. Uh, uh, he's so deep when you talk to him. The warrior monk. And I don't want him to find me and punch me uh, for for talking about him. 
But the idea was that uh, his chief of staff right across the hall was uh, Crusher, Colonel Clark Lathine. And uh, so Lathine would always tell me, hey, he's in a good mood, he's in a bad mood. You got three minutes, you got two minutes, whatever else. And the funny thing about uh, Jim Mattis is when you go in, hey, you don't talk a lot. Uh, Mattis is on transmit. And and, uh, so Mattis would come up and he'd go, this is important, this is important, this is important. I want you to do that. Thanks, everything else. And then he would come out and he would watch the training. He was one of those that was very hands-on. General Amos was like that too. Amos would drop in and, and want to walk the walk. And he wouldn't talk to you. He talked to the Marines. He'd go out there and say, hey, what are we learning today? What did you learn? What's going on? And when the numbers started coming back that we were making a difference, much like uh, 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 later in Afghanistan when insider threats were going and we built the uh, the insider threat situation awareness training, uh, the ASAT for the Army. You know, there's a lot of programs that spawned out of my, my original work with Combat Hunter. That's when they started saying, we have something here. These Marines are somehow different. They're looking at battle different. The Army adopted everything else. So the, the one day uh, uh, Mattis made that comment and he says, hey, I want everybody to meet Greg Williams. He's a, he's a national treasure. He saved a lot of lives. And I went up and like an idiot, I boloed and said, thanks, Colonel, and went on with my piece of the, uh, w- w- with my piece of the speech. So nothing better than calling a three-star <laughs> You know, uh, uh, a colonel in front of everybody. So I'm a bonehead, though. Yeah, I'm a you know, The reason I I had to move to Gunnison because I'm the village idiot, and it's easier being a village idiot in a smaller village. Well, I think it's amazing that you you know I want to go back to the point where you said there was hundreds of tri- people at the yep. at the warfighting lab that there was hundreds of them that were trying out came down to came down to you three. Um, of course, everyone had probably skill sets that were similar. Um, what do you think was different? And how you and the final three stood out was it the, the core contents of what you guys taught? Was it being able to teach it as well? Were there other some kind of other skill sets that were able yeah. to set you apart from somebody else? Was it curriculum development? What 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 was it? You think? Yeah. So so uh, not to uh, not to speak down to anybody or about anybody, but everybody had a hand in of course. combat hunter. They all wanted, you know, every general wants to invent a P thirty eight. They want to be the one that goes down and says, you know, the the uh, beanie weenies were my idea. So so what happened is we had measurement and assessment and training, and then there was some sour grapes sometimes because people wanted it to go away uh, a, a direction that it wasn't really going. The idea is that you're sending uh, not always uh, our best and brightest. Uh, 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 Pete Carroll was on a small unit decision-making uh, trek with me going around the country. And I was, again, the village idiot. I had no idea who Pete Carroll was. I thought he was just a motivational speaker, right? And he's up there talking about winning forever and this and that and the other. I go, hey, yeah. who is this guy? And somebody says, you don't know who Pete Carroll is. And I go, now. And so they introduced me and we talked. Pete Carroll has the ability to take the Seahawks 1%. fan, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And he's a wonderful man, by the way. But he's got the ability uh, uh, to reach out and take the 1% of the best 1% of 1% of the top coaches, right? And then put together a team and take them uh, uh, into combat, you know, football being their version of combat. Uh, the Army doesn't have that. The Marine Corps doesn't have that. You, you get people that enlist, and some of them really, really want to be there but can't make the cut. And other ones are, you know, like me, a, a, a tragic, fragile snowflake that has seams and gaps that need to be filled. And so it would be great if everybody that went to combat or everybody that was a police officer was a doctor and had a minor in education, right? But that's not the way it is. So what was happening with a lot of the programs that they were trying to put down, they were going to give them a thing. Here's an AT4. Train on this. This is going to help. This is a JDAM. This is how you use a JTAC in combat to call you know, uh, 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 fires on a position, all this stuff, which was great. But but you got to remember, under that brain bucket, there's still a kid. You get what I'm trying to say? And they've got to understand right from wrong, good from evil. What should I do? Yeah. So uh, uh, coming into a room and having an auditorium filled and saying, we're now going to discuss strategic and operational comms to a, a lance corporal, a sergeant, uh, or even a private, uh, sometimes missed the point. So my thing is, we always call it street it up. So I would street it to things you do every day and how you uh, walk into the 7-Eleven in the morning and what it feels like in your barrio or your city or where you grew up. And that uh, created within these soldier, sailors, airmen, and Marines, the ability to personalize the information and then say, wait a minute, uh, uh, Kandahar, Bagram is not so different from where I grew up. 
You get what I'm trying to say? Hey, these similarities, there's many more similarities than there are differences. Yeah, so that- Maybe I can capitalize on those to to be safer and to see opportunities. And and that was the same when, when uh, I remember touring a- a Iraq uh, uh, and everything was outside the wire and everything was uh, still up in the air all the time. And we'd go to like Camp Korean Village or Tartar or, or you know, uh, uh, Takatum or something. And it would come and the guy would try to give me the brief on the area. And I was like, okay, you give me the brief on the area. You show me the, who the warlords are. You show me this and that and the other. But we're not talking about the people. So we started talking to people. It was sort of like, you know, a, a, a community development one door at a time and understanding that they're not so different than, than we are. Once, uh, once that seesaw tipped, we did a lot better, I think. I really do. I think what 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 enabled you to be able to build a combat hammer program versus somebody else and probably the ability to transfer the skills to uh, street it up, as you said. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And and you know the the idea is that uh, uh, I was poked and prodded and, and still am. Uh, Army Research Institute, Officer Naval Research, you know, Cognitive Performance Group, all these different companies uh, uh, or or organizations would come in to make sure that it was all science all the time, all the skills I was transferring actually were real things, not these parlor tricks that everybody else uh, wants to buy a book on how to read the guy playing poker or, you know, how to improve your, your love stake and, you know, farmersonly.com. Yeah. And, and uh, every one of those doctors would come up and I was very lucky. Again, it's, it's not me. It's the, the program and the training. And they would come up and they go, you know, I, I'm a doctor at this skill and you just put it in two succinct st- sentences for this, 19 year old that's about to go to combat and they go, Oh, good to go. You know what I'm saying? So, so, uh, God, Buddha, Vishnu, Allah, uh, whoever you believe yeah. in has given me yeah. the ability to communicate on this wavelength, this very specific laser, laser focused wavelength. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm really good at it. I'm very lucky. So we, we've talked about combat hunter. We've talked about human behavior pattern recognition. Um, but we haven't talked about exactly what it was and what it was used for. It was basically, yep. like you said, uh, a lot of IEDs, uh, trying to yep. figure out ways to, to avoid them. Um, and like I told Brian, when he, when he first described human behavior pattern recognition is to me, it sounded like minority report stuff, yeah. uh, finding patterns in criminal behavior before it happens. Yep. Uh, I remember him saying, yeah, but it's more than that. What's your definition of it? Which, and, and, and give me an example. Yeah. So, so. Uh, Brian is, Brian Marin is my absolute best friend. He's an incredible instructor, uh, vice president of operations for Arcadia Cognorati, our company, uh, uh, a host of, of, of left to Greg, the podcast. And, and because Brian, just like me, we're still learning, uh, we're at different windows on that Fabergé egg of life. So Fabergé made these eggs and you look into the little window and there's a street scene for Easter and there's the bunny and there's a taxi and stuff. So, so uh, Brian is saying, gosh, it's so much more complicated. I would counter saying Brian is correct, but it's so much simpler than you're making it. Uh, uh, you have to look at intent. Motive is meaningless. Human beings display intent in everything that they do. For example, if you're driving down the road today and you see a person that's driving more aggressively than others, they're not using their turn signal, okay, what should you expect next? Well, you're going to expect that their behavior is going to continue along that vein. They're, uh, uh, they're going to follow too close. They're going to do these. Things. Well, that means that it increases that person's risk for an accident. Same thing, the number one things that are going to kill you in combat, uh, there's three. Uh, uh, it, it's going to be a sniper, it's going to be a bomb, and bombs mean suicide bomber, IED, VBID, any of those other uh, type of explosive devices. And, yeah. and sniper means anybody with a gun, basically. Let's let's make it simple. And the third is yeah. an insider threat. Somebody that yep. you've trusted your entire life, it, it's going to bounce up and say, uh, uh, you know, uh, give up the cheese. The idea is that if you can live your life understanding that, uh, one, uh, uh, you always want to portray yourself as an opponent, never a victim, but you also want to be the bending reed. You don't want to come off as the, I'm ready to fight all the time because somebody will call your bluff. Um, you can't always go into a situation and be the person that's directing things. Sometimes you got to shut up and watch things. And I'm very good at watching how things are going and saying, you know, it's Colonel Mustard in the study with the pipe wrench. And, and so all I was uh, uh, able to do is say that human behavior uh, repeats patterns because all human beings are lazy. We go to the same places every day. We stop and get gas at the same places. We uh, fill our pantry with the same items over and over and over throughout our life. If you can tap into that 
and figure out why. Like, for example, if I'm watching a group at 1,800 meters away with a, a, a you know, Sasser scope and I see that the group is happy, okay? Happy is an emotion. Emotions are on board so we can function in an environment with the electrochemical neurotransmitters in our brain and give everybody else mirror neurons so they can mimic our emotions. Well, it's the same as if I'm in a room, a boardroom for a major company. If you can tap into the emotional content of what's happening around you, for example, I don't need to find the bomb. I need to think, where would you have to put the bomb for it to do the most danger? I don't need to locate the sniper with all this trillion dollar gear. I just have to say, look, in this environment, there's only a couple places that a sniper could ply their trade. So it's taking normal situations winnowing them down to the, the simplest possible mathematical equation and saying, this is more likely than that. That's all I do. And, and, and that's why I say, beware of charlatans, because any book that tells you, hey, in three steps, you can be this or that, that's not like that, man. Life is a little more complicated, but it's also not rocket science. It's science, but it's not rocket science. So you can make it easy. You can teach your kids. I mean, you know, you can be a, a safer human on the way to work in the morning. And it's all through recognizing those human patterns and seeing that the behavior is, is in this instant dangerous and in this instant never becomes dangerous. That's all it is. I've heard you, I've heard you on another podcast talk about gas stations, how they're the, the most dangerous yeah. places in the world. Is that what, what, yeah. what made you come to that, come up with that? that so, um, no, no, no. Tanner, Tanner, that's a, a great thing. So, so uh, uh, Marin is very grounded and Marin's from Chicago and he's from an Irish family. Uh, so when Mary gets stuck on something and uh, it's always, see, it's another gas station. And, and it's funny because it's true, but I don't want everybody going out and saying, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to have gas shipped to my home. The idea is certain environments are more dangerous <laughs> okay. than other environments, right? And, and you have to classify in your life, which ones uh, uh, those are. So, so uh, I, I'd like to say that a yellow pad is your best friend. And take a look at the things when you're in a hurry. When you're in a hurry and you only have a limited engagement, those places should be at the top of your list. So if you're not in control of the time and the distance, like on a patrol, and you're being rushed into something, and you have to go down a certain road to fix them, you know, to finish the mission, what you're doing is you're stop thinking, and now you're not looking for IDs. You're not scanning for insider threats. Well, the same occurs in your environment when you're at the gas station. I'm almost out of gas. I'm on my way home. I got to drop off the rental car. I'm not paying attention. We attend to, that's where we get the term attention. Guess what? We're not attending to as much. So situation awareness, this is one thing I want to make sure everybody listen, uh, understands. Situation awareness is cool. People have made billions of dollars uh, uh, on selling you situation awareness. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is critical thinking, understanding when your lower levels of situational awareness make you dumber and more vulnerable and increase your critical thinking during those times to make sure that you look around. Make sure you drive around the gas station before you stop. Make sure you call the non-emergency number to local coppers and go, hey, I'm about to stop at the Sitgo on exit 67. Anything I need to know? And trust me, your copper friends will say, yeah, uh, take with you some yellow evidence tape, right? Those are the type of things that we don't do. Why in combat? Do we make plans and do we talk about comms and intel and, and all this wonderful uh, uh, information that we have to process? But in our daily lives, we don't take the same, uh, you know, the same level of fidelity. All I'm saying is time and distance, slow things down. Yes, gas stations are those danger zones, but, but where isn't? You know, the local shopping center could be, a parking lot could be. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's up to you. Uh, yes, situation awareness is important, but it's not the end all be all critical thinking is the end all be all. I guess that kind of leads into my next, where, where I was going next is like, how did you make the bridge from the combat hunter program for the Marine Corps into human pattern recognition behavior? And, you know, with that, you're now training, like I said, tier one units, federal law enforcement yeah. agencies uh, with three letters, fortune 500 companies, even some foreign militaries. Yep. Um, how did that, how did that evolve? Yeah. It, it, so in my basement in East Detroit in the seventies, when I was a kid, uh, we were doing human behavior pattern recognition analysis. The idea is that it never found its home until you had a bunch of bright uh, uh, generals running the Marine Corps at the time, and they were the tip of the spear at the time, that said, holy crap, that's, the, that's one of the answers. That's yeah. part of the answer. So again, I'm just a guy 
uh, uh, I would tell the best way in my dojo to get your next belt level wasn't to spar and, with, and to fight. It was to be able to predict what the other person was going to do before they did it, a la Miyamoto Masashi, you know, uh, win or lose before they draw the sword. So that type of, of mentality has been around. Good ideas stick yeah. around. So uh, I use that again in the Army. Uh, I, was, I was very lucky uh, to, to win a couple of division-level awards as, as an NTO uh, uh, for hard-to-solve problems because I promoted critical thinking and de-escalation at every es- effort. Look, some people need to be killed, and, and you got to be really highly skilled uh, to kill certain people, but it's almost never that you have to execute that that final option, yeah? So so then I use that in police work, and you know, I, I, I caught 3,000 uh, uh, felons in my first 10 years as a cop, uh, and that was a, a blistering record. So I got a bunch of awards for that. Well, that was all not due to me. It was due to these fundamental things that I found in science that said people repeat behaviors, take a look for this. Once you find that thread, yeah. pull it, and that's where all the information is. So, so uh, uh, when I went to that test out in Pendleton, uh, they gave us a bunch of hard problems. And they said, okay, we got this, we got this, we got this. Everything was a thing. It was looking at a map. It was looking at a compass. It was determining, uh, you know, crowd mechanics and dynamics. And I brought it down to a think. How do people think? How would you think at your dinner table? How would you think if your kid got shot? How would you think if this, you know, Marine unit moves into your village? And once we, once we changed how we looked, and now it's, you, you got to understand all these programs, uh, 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 combat hunter, you know, I, I'm the architect of combat hunter program. I'm the architect of advanced situational awareness training for the Marine Corps, uh, soft set, uh, uh, for the soft community, uh, uh, gatekeeper, uh, all these programs about suicide or situ- uh, you know, sexual harassment, uh, protocols. Okay. They all came out of human behavior, which nobody was looking at back then. So, so I was lucky enough too to open people's eyes mm. to a science that nobody was going after. Uh, at the time. And now, now, now it's how things are. Now they're programs of record. You know, there, there's not a program in the world that doesn't have a human behavior analyst that's taking a look at uh, a piece of it. So there's what you're saying is that there's the core principles of the combat hunter, the core meaning of human pattern behavior and recognition yep. are applied to, you, you've been able to apply them to many different scenarios, many different things yep. that a lot of different, I guess, industries have picked up. Very good. Um, human behavior pattern recognition. How can one start a career path down a career path such as that? Yeah. So, uh, people watching is fun and it makes you smarter and safer. Uh, the other thing is I write, uh, uh, everything down and I take hundreds of photographs every day. Uh, that number jumps to, uh, probably a thousand when we're when we're uh, on the road, uh, because humans uh, viscerally love uh, uh, to see images, and and uh, I turn uh, you know what cave paintings are now powerpoints, and most people are like yawning through powerpoints. What I do is I have just a photo or a video up there, and what we do is I'll break it down for you what I see. Then after you've done three or four photos of a certain topic. I'll step outside and I'll, I'll do a range walk with you. And I'll say, now you see this guy over here with his shopping cart. Let's take a look. He's going to put it here or he's going to go to his car. Uh, so the idea is you don't need me for those early stages. You can do those. Then understand that sociological, physiological, and psychological uh, uh, principles are essential to a good human behavior profile. So take those courses when you're in school. One, uh, you'll never be bored. They're exciting and wonderful. And then con- continue to conduct real-time experiments on the road. Uh, 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 what is this person going to do next? Well, how likely is it that they're going to do this next? And that predictive analysis then uh, becomes a skill that you get better and better at. Everybody wants to say, these nine things mean this. That's not how life works. The idea is that it's a scale. And the more cues that you get that indicate that danger is likely, the more likely that danger is. I mean, so so study, uh, read. There's a lot of incredible books out there that are just gathering dust. Uh, come to a course. We've got live courses. Marin and I are on the road all the time doing it. We got free webinars on the website. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we're we're writing right now for McGraw Hill a, a great book, but it's not going to be out for a little while. 
uh, come see us, call us, write us. Uh, everything we do on the website's free. So all you got to do is say, hey, I've always had this question. I apologize. That's probably Marin calling a complaint now. And uh, what happens is uh, the more you accumulate that knowledge, the better you're going to get. And, and, and Tanner, look, this isn't about me. This is about uh, uh, me opening doors for others. And so there's veterans out there that said, hey, I went to the course, so I'm going to write a book and I'm going to do my own thing. It's okay. But that's like going to the library and getting Melville's Moby Dick uh, and using some whiteout and, you know, highlighter and changing, the, you know, some of the stuff that you didn't like. That's not what it is. What it is, is you inside you, you unique uh, veteran have this accumulated knowledge with which you can make somebody else's ruck lighter. You can make their life better. And, and uh, so, you know, that's what we're doing now is, is we're going to go around yeah. and, and if it's a company that can afford a lot of money, we'll charge them a lot. If it's somebody who can't afford anything, we'll teach them how to do it for free. Great. What's the best part about what you do? What do you enjoy the most about it? I love humans. And, and I think that when humans are in their most fragile state, they're the most fun uh, uh, to, to deal with. Uh, so his long uh, history of an advanced hostage negotiator as a cop around the road, as a soldier, being outside the wire in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, being lucky enough to visit 53 countries and teach our forces, coalition forces and coppers, the interaction with humans, all humans are the same. Somebody right now is going to tune out when they heard me say that. They're all the same. We all have the same wants and needs. And this isn't some ridiculous Maslow hierarchy of needs. This is humans. Sit down yeah. with the people in your community. Sit across with your family, your wife, your 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 uh, husband, your significant other. Uh, uh, go to uh, a church lunch for a church you've never been at before. Uh, 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 go to a meeting of cigar aficionados uh, in your town and sit down and find out what they're all about. And you know what you're going to find out? You know, the, the whole reason that uh, we're so messed up on politics is because the powers that be can't imagine that we got it so wrong, that people in the flyover states or this or that, I don't care about, you know, we're, we're soldiers, so, so we don't care about who's in office uh, because we have, you know, a pledge that we're going to protect the U.S. Constitution and, and our United States against all enemies, foreign or domestic, right? So we don't care about the politics. But they do, and they don't understand that it's a common person. My training takes me into your living room. It takes me into places I could never have been, and it allows me to sit down at a Shura or a Jerga or a, a business meeting at a Fortune 100 uh, company and, and talk to some executives. And I found out they're all alike, terrorists and criminals and, and good people. They're all alike. They all the same basic skills, same uh, workup as you and me. And that, that's why the skill works anywhere. What do you see as, as, as being similar across the board when you, when you, when you come in contact with all these people? Yeah. So you may uh, be surprised that everybody uh, poops. There's a great book out there that calls that. And, and therefore there's a whole idea of how, how that goes and what, you know, what a moon is on an outhouse. And uh, I will tell you that most people stick a sandwich in their mouth, uh, not in their rectum. Uh, and I know I'm making fun of that. Most people drive uh, uh, inside the car, not standing on the car with two ropes on the steering wheel. You got to break life down and look for the similarities. When you find the similarities, look, I've been to countries where I had a pointy talkie because I didn't have a, 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 a interpreter or a translator. And, you know, I did just fine. I, I didn't have to learn the language uh, uh, to be able to read the writing on the wall. Uh, uh, graffiti tells a story. Uh, how uh, uh, a person keeps their vehicle, uh, go in a parking lot, a random parking lot, and look inside of a car and try to determine who in the store owns that car just by the bumper stickers, how it was washed, uh, the, the McDonald's uh, uh, wrappers that are inside. It's a game. It's fun. And all humans, like uh, uh, I've never met anybody where I went into their house in, in any country where they said, uh, uh this is my daughter. I hate her. She's an idiot. Everybody loves their daughter. And everybody goes, this is my son. He's an impetuous fool. And I've got to <laughs> knock him on the head once in a while. Right? Those kind of universal things. And what happens is you look at those, like people tell me in every country, they go, my teenage kid is being such a pain that I, I swear I want to kill him. I brought him into this world. I want to take him out. And then I'll scientifically lay it out for him that your kid needs to go and they need to grow their own tribe. And this is how they do it. They don't understand, but their body and brain are changing. Once you use science, uh, um, uh, science is like math. I don't have to go to Germany and learn the German laws of gravity. You get what I'm trying to say? I take those uh, sunrise in the east and, and sets in the west. Yeah. 
Bruce Willis, you know, water's wet, sky's blue, uh, uh, from whatever that movie was. Uh, uh, those constants are what keep us from spinning into the sun. And everybody understands that. Uh, on the flip side of that, what's the most challenging part of what you do? <laughs> Humans, um, people. So you can lead a horse to water and <laughs> you can't an make him drink. Yeah, yeah, I know it's a loaded question, so I gave you a loaded answer. So, so uh, uh, there's books out there on how to profile a serial killer. There's books out there on how to profile an active shooter or a school shooter. And that's great. If your entire life is writing about things that have already occurred, you're a historian, uh, uh, you're not conducting predictive analysis. Everybody here knows a broken human. Uh, so when a suicide happens, and, and suicides are horrible, sad things that plague the veteran community. People tell me all the time that, listen, there were no signs. And then we'll talk for an hour, and I'll have three yellow pad pages of the signs. And I'll say, you've got to take this information. You've got to spread it everywhere. You've got to tell yeah. people. You've got, you got to understand what it's like to be a broken human and feel like you can't talk to anybody. So, so humans are really bad about being transparent, about saying something when they see something, uh, uh, I don't want to get involved. And yes, Timmy said this and they did that and he was going this way. So what we've got to do is we've got to be uh, uh, our brother's keeper. And I'm saying brother, sister, I don't understand those uh, uh, differences and I don't understand differences in color, but I do understand that we've got to look out for each other. We're all we've got. And so going forward, uh, the less complicated our communications become, the more we care about our friends, the more we'll be able to see when they're in trouble and they have stress fractures. Look, yeah, I had a guy a couple of weeks ago in California uh, lit his house on fire, drove to work and started shooting people at work. Where does that come from? Did that come out of nowhere? No, because you go back and you interview everybody. Wouldn't you think it's odd that somebody lit their house on fire before going to work? That kind of sends a message. It's something as simple as leaving your car running with the door open, indicating that you're not coming back. Those are pre-event indications. And once we look at those cues, we can analyze them very quickly and say, this isn't going to end well. Or we have to intercede and say something you know, to the school or to the parent or, or something else. Everything is solvable. Yes, they're hard problems, but humans want to be lazy. They want to remain in the dark. And when I tell them the course is hard, they, they don't want to take my course. <laughs> when I tell them it's going to take, uh, you know, three days or five days, they're like, yeah, but do you have an, uh, a one hour version? Yeah, <laughs> no, I don't. It doesn't matter. No matter what, you're always going to ask. Somebody's always going to ask for it if it's shorter. That's, that's you know, that's that. true. It's true. I'm almost anything. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so you and Brian, now, and we've talked a lot about Brian. He's in our, his episodes in our archives. I think it's in the one nineties yeah. uh, episode one ninety one or something like that. Now, Brian talked to the fact that you guys spent a lot of time in the dirt, uh, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Iraq, yep. and that's where you guys met. It's been, it's been a little bit of time to process Afghanistan, uh, and with the last troops leaving, uh, analyzing it, not from a political point of view, but from a human pattern point of view, have you allowed yourself to do that yet? Yeah. And, and, you know, here's, here's the thing. Uh, I'm no longer Afghanistan relevant. So, uh, and, and the beauty of what I teach, I don't have to be because I teach intent. So what, what surprised me from a human behavior pattern recognition analysis standpoint was how many people were willing to step up and say, Hey, I was there and this is my experience, which is completely human. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Like, like, I don't know if you know this thing, LinkedIn, I, I'm on no social media, but I have a LinkedIn account and I really don't understand it because somebody will come up and say, Hey, listen, my daughter accomplished this and look at how my son is doing. And the person comes on and instead of just giving them a thumbs up or a support, I always use support, by the way, if you've ever been supported by me, it means I support what you're up to. And the person will write this whole note and saying, yeah, when I was in this thing and when I was that, you know what? No offense, but kiss me. Can't you just sit, be nice and be happy for another human being and revel in what they're doing? So in Afghanistan, what we wanted to do is we wanted to point fingers. We yes. wanted to stick a finger in somebody's eyes. We wanted to say, yeah, we knew it was coming. Well, let's, let's discuss that for a moment. Where was your message on LinkedIn a year before Afghanistan fell? Where was it six months before? Where were you saying, hey, these things are turning bad. We need to start looking at it. Now, if you were part of the people that were sending out those messages, good to go. If you wait till something happens <clears throat> and days uh, uh, later, 
say, hey, my experience was different and this is what we should have done. You know, people saying, hey, send me. Yeah, all that bravado is not helping anybody. And emotionally, it's not putting anything to rest that needs to be put away. Afghanistan is nebulous. It's never going to go away in our lifetime. And I don't mean the 20-year war. I mean what's happening now, what's going to happen tomorrow. That's where we need to put our time and our money. Uh, uh, somebody coming to oh, yeah. grips with a $85 billion uh, uh, weapons budget and all that other stuff. Okay, so what? At the end of the day, ask yourself, so what? At what you know, at key levels during your day of what you're doing. I'm going out to wash my car today. I'm going to have lunch. I'm going to skip workout. Why? What's in it for me? And and Afghan people are wonderful. You know, not the Afghan people aren't the Taliban. Nobody supports terrorism unless they're a fringe player, right? Yeah. But we have extremists here too. So take a look. What can we do today and tomorrow and, and in the next three to five years? that puts a positive spin on Afghanistan. And I refuse to sit in a room with somebody who says, there's nothing, we can do nothing, all is lost. And for some reason, that's America today, right? And, and the pundits all wanna throw in the towel and say, oh man, it's all over. Listen, there's wonderful things that are coming out. Nobody wants to see their kid come back in a box. Uh, uh, and, and those kids knew what they were getting into when they went over there. And uh, I, I felt horrible because I'm really good on the ground, I'm great training those people to avoid vehicle-borne IEDs, to, to avoid those type of ambush attacks. So it hit me hard. I, cr I cried for an afternoon. Uh, uh, and then I said, okay, I got to get up and I got to go back to work. I think it's really important the fact that you said, what can we do now, next, yep. you know, tomorrow? Uh, you know, because we, we, we talk about the after effects of, of an, 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 a pullout like that. You know, uh, we're, still, we're still dealing with the after effects of that from yes. a mental state of mind from our Vietnam veterans, you know, yes, 30, absolutely. 40 years later, sometimes 50 years later. So, so what can we do? I think it's very important. The fact that you said, what can we do now, especially from a VA standpoint, you know, what can we do now for these veterans that are going to be very feeling very similar effects in Afghanistan yep. that just happened. How can we change what happened from Vietnam to, to Afghanistan? Yep. So, so I'm going to stay at 30,000 foot level. I don't want to violate any secret handshakes here, but I will tell you this, okay? Uh, knowing a little bit of something about Grenada, knowing a little bit something about Liberia, knowing a little bit something about Panama, you don't see a lot of that stuff in the news and you don't talk to a lot of those vets. One of the greatest things about my ranch in Rogue Manor West, where I live now, is I'm in the middle of flipping nowhere. And I run into veterans all the time. And I always take a minute to ask the veteran their story, whether they're wearing a hat or a shirt or a ring. I'm a profiler. I look at humans. I figure out who's the vet. I, I can take a look at your tats and tell you that you were likely a vet and you were likely a poser, right? And so I'll stop that person no matter where I am in town and I'll say, what's your story? Thanks for your service. And I really mean it. And, and I'll give you an example of that, Tanner. Uh, Brian's an ambassador for Carry the Load. Uh, I'm active in Carry the Load, but I'm not an ambassador because I can't give it the time I would, I would want to give it. Uh, um, I am active, uh, for example, on September 15th, Wednesday, uh, 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 in Crested Butte at the Crested Butte Center for the Arts here outside of Gunnison in Colorado in the, in the sticks. Uh, uh, we put together a rural veteran outreach program. Why? Because I ran into some incredible people in Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, they understood that uh, there was a lapse in the healthcare system, so they created the VA's mobile medical unit. It goes out to these rural areas where these vets are, they bring it to you. So when it's the Veterans Administration, Veterans Benefit Administration, uh, uh, the Veterans uh, uh, Reentry Training, uh, the Vet Center for re uh, uh, Readjustment Counseling, all of these services are available. And you know what? I'm running into a guy that's a Vietnam vet. And like, like I talk about Don Yeager, I love Don Yeager, hero of the 173rd in the Central Highlands. His dad is uh, uh, the, the recently deceased uh, General uh, Chuck Yeager. His kid is hero of uh, uh, Fallujah, the first and second battles, uh, Kip Yeager. Yeah. And, and I ask uh, uh, Yeager, hey, uh, uh, where's the VA? And Yeager says, it's somewhere in Grand Junction. And that's four hours away on a good day, one way, you know? Where, where do you have to be that you're so far away that you can't talk across the hood of a car to another vet, find out their experiences, and now for the Veterans Administration to say, we're going to bring this mobile medical unit to you, and we're going to come to you? That's why we're doing these type of uh, uh, rural outreach programs, because not everybody lives near a big city, and they feel like, like I can't tell you how many veterans, uh, specifically Vietnam-era veterans, and, and then again, Gulf War uh, uh, now because it's becoming more... The vets in and around Gunnison and Gunnison County are a bunch of uh, 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 cowboys and ranchers. So they're generally older. 
and they felt that the country and the VA forgot them. That's no way to feel. So, so part of what Brian and I do, you know, the funny thing is Brian, Brian knows uh, much more than I do about this. Every time we talk about suicide on the show, the show gets its lowest ratings and nobody turns in. You know why? Nobody wants to talk about that. Whenever we talk about our vets not availing themselves of these incredible programs because they're too far or, or you know, I, I, I just can't get there from here kind of thing. My, my thing is that's a hard problem to solve, but let's get on it because I want no vet left behind and specifically in the middle of nowhere. And our training is like that. Look, we do one thing. We do human behavior training and we'll take it to wherever you are in the world. I think it's really important that, uh, that you recognize that because I think that's where community care comes in. You know, being able yes. to say, "Hey, it's four hours away. Let's get some. Let's now you can go and get something in your own community." That's where nonprofits come in. That's where VSOs come in. I don't think, yep. you know, the government. It, it shouldn't be just the government's problem. Okay, the government isn't. We, the government should. You know, you, you can go a political side on that, but it's a community problem more than a a government federal fix your issue problem. What do you think? Absolutely, the the, think the VSO. No, you're spot on. The VSO for Gunnison County is Al Falsetto. Uh, uh, the VSO for for uh, 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 Crested Butte, which is a little bit further away, is Steve Otero. Uh, uh, when and this is how God and and Buddha and Vishnu and Allah work in in this realm. So Shelly and I have the ranch, and not just the dude and guest ranch with the whitewater rafting and the fly fishing and all the fun stuff that we wanted to do for the rest of our life, but we're devoted to veterans. We're devoted to, to, to uh, human beings, uh, casting for recovery, everything. That's uh, Our whole mission was to make somebody's uh, rucksack lighter and their stake in life better. So our uh, head wrangler uh, for the 13 years that Shelly and I uh, uh, owned, operated, and ran the ranch was a guy named Joe Weber. So uh, Joe Weber is uh, his life partner is a guy named Tim Gein. Now, Tim never served, but everybody in Tim's family served. Joe never served, but Joe knows how uh, important uh, being a veteran is to Shelly and I and how much outreach that we do. So one day in passing, Joe Weber tells me, well, you know, Tim, my life partner, Tim, is uh, the guy from Grand Junction. He's the Veterans Administrative Coordinator, coordinator and everything else. And I'm like, no way. Life is so small, right? So he introduces me to Vic Bico, Jen Castillo, uh, uh, <laughs> Steve Otero, all these other people. And they go, so what, what do you do? And I go, well, I run a ranch and we do all these great things. And they're like, no way. And it's like, way. And so it's like, why can't we work together to, to get some information? And I'll tell you what, it's, it's pushing uh, against an open door 90% when you talk to veterans because they want to get involved. They want to do something, but, but there's also oh, in the 100%. world, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also in the world, a uh, classic obstructionist. It'll never work. We're all going to die. What do we do next? And, and we've allowed our nation uh, 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 to embrace this classic obstructionist instead of booting them and uh, throwing them to the curb and saying tabula rasa, baby, let's start over. If it's hard where you live, it can be better. If your life blows, it can be better. If you need veterans help, you can get it. There's so many more ways uh, to reach out for it now than there ever have been, Tanner. And, and I'll tell you what, you, you do an incredible service. I should not be on this show because I'm not the type of hero that you generally have on this show. I don't have a story. My story blows in comparison with the people that you put on. But mm -hmm. if this is a vehicle for change to get one person to call the VA or one person to get help, man, we've accomplished something wonderful today. Uh, you're too, you're too kind. Uh, no, uh, your story is, is definitely warranted. I think, I think your message, what you guys do is extremely interesting. Um, yeah, don't give yourself any credit. Uh, get out of here. Uh, okay. So left a great podcast. Uh, when Brian was here, it was in its infancy. Yeah. Uh, you guys were dissecting something about Disney at the time. Uh, I thought that was a great episode. Uh, you're, you're over 135 episodes now, yep. roughly where I was at when I took over the Born the Battle podcast, right. I was about 135. Uh, podcasts naturally they they change and evolve uh, when people find their audience and and when the when the hosts find their voice. Where are you guys at now? That's a, a excellent question again. So so if if you want to binge watch, we're not going to say no. But but Marin and I are are purists and and uh, we're always talking about somebody. Don't start at the beginning. Kind of start in the middle somewhere. Because you know what? We've got a lot of good friends and our friends, uh, because uh, uh, almost all of them are veterans or former LE. They have no filters. 
So they tell you right away, well, that episode sucked. This was horrible. At the beginning, we were trying to save the world and save lives. And it was almost in a declarative knowledge sort of way. We were going to talk about this topic and we were going to tell you how it is. Mm. Then what happened is we found that it was easier when it was just Brian and I having those same discussions that uh, left of Greg comes from the fact that Brian's always driving from the airport. Driver drives. I'm giving directions. I'm on the phone with the venue. I'm doing that. And we're always living out of hotels and rental cars. So Brian said, wouldn't it be cool that people could hear what we talk about when we change that format? to it's just us talking about topical issues. And I, I would say a good 80% of what we talk about is uh, uh, viewer or listener informed, where they go, well, what happened here? Why did this situation happen? And we break it down into street verse. We give them the science behind it. And in every episode, we give one or two or three cool things that you can do today to change your stake in life, to make your so safer, faster, smarter, harder to kill. Uh, uh, and it's all free. And that's cool too, because, you know, I, I, I shouldn't have to, you know, nobody, you need to go to the gym, you need to flip the tires, you need to do the rope thing and, you know, uh, 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 climb the ladders and stuff. But there's almost nobody that's listening to your podcast or my podcast that's doing that with any regularity. And I hate to say that, but humans are lazy. So is there a way that I can still be safe and smart and get my kids to school and handle all these uh, tough issues in life without being, you know, you see those guys. I, I see a guy on LinkedIn throwing knives and shooting uh, and reloading fast and lifting tires. I couldn't do that with a winch. Uh, so I need to know that I can be a hero in my own life uh, without having to invest that kind of time or, or have those type mm. of genetics. Gotcha. Has, uh, has Brian experienced true emotion yet? <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, Sheldon on that, uh, thir what is that show? The, uh, uh, gosh, darn the, uh, big bang theory. Bang. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I apologize. I don't watch that. Uh, yeah. yeah. You're exactly right. I don't, I don't watch, uh, uh, television very often, but, uh, there's a scene with that Sheldon where, uh, his girlfriend says something like, look, he mimics all the emotions of a real boy that Brian is a wonderful, loving, caring person that cries at, uh, uh, at uh, sad movies and funerals. I can't allow him to understand that I see that side of him because that's his protective armor right now. And we all have that. You know, my protective armor is uh, 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 my, my weight and my humor uh, uh, and self-deprecation, right? Uh, Marin's armor is that, you know, he's the guy. He's always together. He's always got control of his emotions. But I got to tell everybody out there because we deal with veterans and and uh, we deal with coppers and we deal with emergency room workers and healthcare workers. Uh, we cry ourselves to sleep every night in our hotel rooms. And and it's okay because it's cathartic. It's okay to do that. Uh, so yeah, so Brian is Brian is deep. You gotta you gotta find that uh, by hanging with Brian a little bit. Uh, and and he doesn't want you to know that Brian's not a stoic. He'll tell you what's on his mind. Gotcha. Layers. He has layers. Yeah. He's an onion, um, a bearded onion. <laughs> Greg, which one? It's, there you go. Exactly. A bearded onion. There you go. Um, Greg, what's one thing that you learned in service that you apply to what you do today? Hmm. So uh, it takes the same amount of time to fail uh, uh, that it does to win. And the best thing about the military was they had something for everything. Like, uh, uh, I don't want to go down all the initials, but whether you're talking about a SMEAC or a SIT rep, or you're talking about a Warno or an op operations order, the military's done it. They've been there. They've done that. And, and I would, I would tell everybody combat hunters from Kansas to Kandahar, uh, you don't have to, to look at the differences, look at the similarities, much easier to learn. I also say battlefield to the boardroom. These are all things that I coined a long time ago because the Fortune 500 companies uh, uh, and Fortune 100 companies I work with, sometimes they're still searching for the type of structure that the military gives you. The military says, here is the McPP. Here's the Marine Corps uh, uh, planning cycle. This is how we uh, uh, do discipline. This is, And you know what? Mm -hmm. The Marine Corps uh, uh, and the Army and the, the uh, Department of Defense are big, slow-moving dinosaurs sometimes, and they make mistakes. But look at what they're investing. They're investing in their most important asset, and that's the people. So if you're constantly investing in people, 
you'll be fine. You'll do great. That means investing in your kids, investing in your mental health, investing in your moral health. I, I, I think we could take uh, uh, those lessons from the military all the time. What is military not too good? <clears throat> uh, military certainly doesn't take care of their veterans the way they should sometimes. Um, the, the, the military sometimes feels political pressure and bolos like the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So if we're going to sit there and just make a list of the, the crap, right, we're never going to enjoy the movie. If we say, ah, look at that, that, that car's from 1957 and the movie's supposed to be from 1950. There's a whole section on the internet uh, of, of people about something rather than saying, this is where we can go from here. So the military experience, their structure, how they try to put everything into digestible chunks uh, I, I think is a great model for anybody out there, anybody, any company. Is, Greg, is there is there a veteran uh, nonprofit or a veteran in the veteran community uh, whom you've had an experience with or whom you've worked with that you'd like to mention? Yeah, um, so uh, Don Yeager, a dear, valued friend, uh, hero of the 173rd in the Central Highlands of, of Vietnam, uh, and his son, Kip. Uh, and, and again, uh, uh, their dad, uh, Chuck Yeager, that did so much for all of us. But that family uh, epitomizes uh, uh, what it means uh, to serve our nation. And they've got a legacy of doing that. Uh, shout out to my dad, uh, 1st Marine Division, Raider Battalion back in World War II. <clears throat> uh, no longer with us. Uh, taught me a ton, uh, sometimes without saying a word. Uh, and... Uh, uh, Brian Marin. Uh, there were a lot of Brian Marins. Listen, every contractor wants to come up and get onto a, a, a gig that's going to go somewhere and is going to pay you to travel all over the world. Uh, Brian wasn't that guy. Uh, Brian was exactly the opposite. Every crappy place in the world that I was training, Brian was there outside the wire doing something. So I kind of adopted him going, this has got to be the right guy. And he's paid me back a million times. Uh, you know, and, and, and Tanner, guys like you, uh, people like you that take the reins of something this big and do an incredible broadcast uh, every time. I, I don't know how you do it. And and again, just honored to be on the show. Appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I mean that. It, Greg, we've talked about a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, is there anything else that I might've missed or anything you'd like to tell the audience? with maybe a parting shot, a parting shot of something you'd like to share. Uh, look, training changes behavior. That's one thing. You can train your way out of the situation that you're in, even when it things doom and gloom and horror and death. Um, there's always a tomorrow with or without you. So for those people that are out there thinking, man, this is the worst. Uh, I'm going to commit suicide. I can't get any farther. Uh, listen, I remember the, the morning after September 11th, uh, that there were places open that you could get a breakfast sandwich. Uh, there were people heading to work. Uh, there were things that were going on. You matter, but only if you're here. Don't let that world go rampant by you. You've got something to give. There's something left to write. There's a painting left to give that's out there. And uh, suicide uh, prevention is near and dear to my heart. Uh, and and vet, veterans outreach. It doesn't take a minute out of your day to tell somebody, hey, thanks for your service. What's your story? Or, or how can I help? And it doesn't have to be a monetary contribution. Sometimes it's lending an ear. You know, sometimes it's just listening, Tanner, uh, uh, that can mean so much. Uh, but I would say that uh, uh, listen to these shows. There's a lot of wisdom in your shows. And, and Born the Battle is uh, a, a great place to start improving your knowledge of fellow humans. We got to get them one way or the other. Machine gun. Firefly, bullets fly, day and night rain. Simplify till we die. Is a rock where the drug lords cut up millions. My pen is a 762 round that'll cut them down in an instant. Point, click, pull the trigger to the tune of falling brass. Full benefits and a purple heart and a Russian made bullet in my back. Raining down lead, punching that cock. Get them, boys, I'm laying down. Thousand rounds, and I ain't bringing back one.